Number five, new species? So apparently there's a new genus and species that's been found. I love it when they make announcements like this, but only with dinosaurs, you know what I mean? It also makes things way more scary, doesn't it? Scientists have discovered the remains of a mysterious truck-sized shark which swam the coastlines of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans around 20 million years ago. That's not a great white or a meg. The newly discovered species is a close relative of the megalodon we're used to seeing and the ancient ancestor of today's great white sharks. Perfect, a hybrid shark. That's what I'm hearing, right? Isn't there like four movies about this already? Like this is Jurassic Park 5, Megalodons in New Jersey. I swear I've seen this. Like we know where this is going. Fortunately for us, there's about 45 million years worth of a gap between all three, leaving scientists scratching their heads on how the shark even evolved. Like when did it die out or did it even die out? Could this be the new Megalodon sightings people have but just like the new sister species? This new species has been named Megalolama paradoxodon. That's pretty sweet. There's gonna be a new metal band with that name soon, just wait. A brand new genus of its own as well. The species name, Paradox, refers to the fact that the shark emerged so suddenly in the geological record after appearing to have split from its closest relative around 45 million years earlier. A paradox. So it's like the daughter of a Meg and the grandmother of a great white. Only five of the species' teeth have been found in California, North Carolina, Japan, and Peru. Based on the remains, the researchers think that the shark grew to around five meters long, making it smaller than its relative, but still absolutely megalithic. Like almost a city bus size. Most importantly, the discovery tests our understanding of the shark family tree because the megalodon and megalolamna are so closely related, scientists are still arguing about the missing branches to said family tree. Yeah, that's horrifying, all right? Number four, origins. All right, let's take a deep dive here before we talk about these new fears that I've recently developed. Also, if you like what we do here on the channel, Hulk smash that like button. It really helps us out here. We like to keep it spooky around here, so let us know down in the comments what your biggest fear of the seven seas are. If it's creepy, if it's crawly, and it swims, Send her over my way. Before these TikTok videos and Google Earth finds, the Megalodon was first written about in 1835 by Swiss American geologist Louis Agassiz, who named the species Carcharodon Megalodon. He was the first one. He was the OG on the case. And of course, the first Megalodon teeth, such as those found by the HMS Challenger in 1873, were dated in 1959 by zoologist Vladimir Cherneski to be around 11,000 to 25,000 years old, popularizing claims of the megalodon still hiding out there somewhere. Megalodons are thought to have reached at least 20 meters in length and lived from about 23 to 2 million years ago. The meg, however, wouldn't be known by its scientific name until the late 1990s, when scientists placed it in its own genus, Carcharoslus. Some paleontologists think that the megalodon and modern white sharks evolved within the same lineage, but now, obviously with this new species found, it's kind of thrown off the family tree a tad. Yeah, they don't know if they should put it like near the ancients or like 60 million years ago megatooth territory, or closer to what we see in the movie Jaws. So they're kind of confused. Somewhere in the middle, give or take, that's like a lot of wiggle room, you know? A lot of years there. In 2008, scientists conducted an experiment to determine the bite force of the great white shark to see what the megalodon could have done damage-wise. The largest great white recorded could produce 18,000 newtons of force versus the megalodon of 180,000 newtons of force. Plus all the shaking around sharks do to rip their food in half. Yeah, all of a sudden I understand the urgency of all these studies. That's horrifying. Number three, new teeth. Okay, so I thought these things were just like hung up on a wall in a museum somewhere. Nope, they're finding these things like every day. Jonathan Valentine found his first megalodon tooth after just like 10 minutes of one of his most recent dives. The fossil hunter has found several huge fresh teeth from the extinct megalodon in North Carolina last month. Jonathan Valentine, who runs the Digging Science website, said in a recent video that his haul included a tooth that was seven inches long and another that was six inches. Dude, that's the size of like your whole hand and like one tooth. One in a mouth of hundreds. That's a big set of jaws. Megalodon tooth finds usually measure between three and five inches, but our boy here got lucky with these two big tooths. According to the Florida Museum of Natural History, on his North Carolina trip, Valentine explored coastlines that form bays and canals that used to be deep water ocean floors millions of years ago. Huge megalodon teeth can be found in these embayments. Florida is typically where he would explore to find megalodon teeth in Ice Age fossils, but these two giant gems were apparently laying in what was a shallow nursery during the Miocene period, where big feet 
female megalodons would come in and have their babies and then ship back out to sea. Those babies would have a variety of different foods to eat and they wouldn't have to worry about other deep water predators being so close to shore. They'd be able to just chill out, grow humongous, and then cruise into the ocean at their own pace. Apparently these waters in North Carolina would be like a nursery and then a feeding frenzy on local whales. Yeah, Valentine said, quote, holy that thing's huge. That thing is insane. That's a big tooth. Wow, that's a pretty good start to this trip. Yeah, I'd say so, dude. You found one of the biggest teeth ever found, and in North Carolina. Also, isn't it scary that they weren't like in the middle of the Atlantic somewhere on a ship? They were like on the shores of North Carolina. Terrifying. Number two, bigger in the cold. A new study reveals that the very, I hope, extinct megalodon or megatooth shark grew to larger sizes in cooler environments than in warmer areas. Kind of goes against what you think when you think about sharks, right? Florida, Bahamas, Mexico, yeah, nope. Yeah, they could be anywhere in the Atlantic or even up by the North Pole. DePaul University's paleobiology took a look through time and space at the body size patterns of the megalodon. In reality, this species is only known from teeth and vertebrae that we found from fossil records. We don't really have a good idea of what it's actually girth looked like. Accepted scientifically though, the thing was at least 50 feet and maybe bigger. The new study re-examined published records of megalodon teeth along with their estimated total body lengths. In the mid 1880s, German biologist Carl Bergman came up with a theory that larger animals thrive in cooler climates because their size, naturally, would help them retain heat more. Therefore, the bigger fish would be in the cold. I catch your drift. Walruses, whales, I get it, I get you. Seems like this at first that the impression that scientists were under was the colder the area, the bigger the animal, therefore the longer and better it would thrive. However, with new studies, it shows that mostly of the unidentified nursery areas that the megalodon liked are all located near the equator in warmer waters, making it even smaller than possibly the ones that were swimming in the cold. It's possible that megs were actually much smaller than the nursery's teeth found in the colder areas, making the cold therapy theory true? It's hard to tell with this creature because like, it swam mostly wherever it wanted. Cold, warm, it didn't care. If it was hungry, it was coming for you. The results of the university indicates that the modern climate change is rapidly accelerating marine habitat shifts to more polar latitudes in apex predators, such as sharks and whales, up near really, really cold areas. This would also lend evidence to the specific diet of the megalodon, which was mostly large whales, who also live in the deep, dark cold. DePaul's conclusion is that not all geographically different megalodon individuals grew to gigantic sizes equally, but the colder creatures were also much, much larger swimming in the cold water, ultimately securing Bergman's OG rule. All right, so the Keys trip is back on then. Warm water for the win. They don't swim there. Or they do both. Oh. And the number one spot, alive? Could we have just found evidence on sonar to prove that there's something absolutely terrifying and massive still swimming the seas? We've found teeth in recent years and last month that have been relatively fresh. We've seen Google Earth blurs signifying that the waters can be really deceiving. Now, researchers think that they caught a little glimpse at something very weird and very big. Apparently sonar showed a 50 foot shark nearing a boat off New England waters. Shark researchers are accustomed to surprises, but the Atlantic shark Shark Institute was a little taken aback when something resembling an extinct megalodon shark appeared to just swim under them on sonar. Of course, flabbergasted after picking up what appeared to be a massive 50 foot shark sized blurb, the sea scanners underneath the boat were fritzing. An Instagram post detailing the alleged discovery is currently making waves on a recent shark research trip. Researchers said, quote, we were amused to see the shape appear on our fish finder for several minutes. Researchers from the Atlantic Shark Institute detected this anomaly in an undisclosed area. Unfortunately, the scientists' excitement quickly faded after the monster just turned out to be a massive monster school of fish. Whew, just sitting in the same spot for a while. Yeah, thank God. Researchers said, quote, We waited for more of the rods to go off. However, much to our disappointment, the shape just started to transition into a large school of Atlantic mackerel that hung around the boat for about 15 minutes. That's terrifying. Yo, can you imagine just a massive murky shadow under your boat for just minutes on end not moving? Just sitting there. I'm pretty sure I would just start playing the Titanic music. You know what I mean? It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Okay, so no actual Megs caught yet, thank God. But it seems like we keep finding these remains, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but not necessarily a good thing. The cool thing, however, is each month there's more and more studies actively searching for this thing. To be honest, I hope it's gone, gone forever. 10-foot hammerheads are scary enough, aren't they? Like eyes on the side of their heads? 
That's terrifying. Number five, giant isopods. No, this isn't a microscopic picture. This isn't a tick or a bug. This is a giant isopod. One of the scariest looking things picking around the ocean floor. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Imagining this thing wiggling around is enough to already be giving me the willies. Don't worry too much. You're not too likely to find one of these things crawling around your home, as they usually live and feed about 1,600 feet beneath the ocean depths. So you'll have to really go looking for one of these creepy little crawlies. We don't know a lot about isopods actually. It's difficult to study them and their habitat unbothered deep in the ocean. And also if I had to guess, I think realistically it's because no one wants to spend any more time looking at one of these little zerglings longer than they have to. Despite their outward appearance, isopods are actually pretty chill. That's the official scientific statement, judging a book by a cover and all that. They're scavengers more than they are predators, waiting at the bottom of the sea for debris to reach them, like discarded bits of meat from crabs or any number of fish which they'll snack on. So basically, they're the moochers of the ocean, waiting for somebody else to do all the work and they'll just uh, clean up the leftovers. It apparently isn't even that big a deal, though, because isopods have been observed to be able to go years and years without eating anything at all, with some reports going as far as five years without eating anything. I could not even imagine the Anger you would feel through that. Enjoying what we're putting out at Top 5 Scary? Of course you are, that's why you're here. Why not toss a cheeky little subscribe our way as a way of saying thanks? We'll trade you the best scary videos this side of the web in exchange. Number 4, Barrel Eye Fish. Has anyone ever accused you of being empty headed? I know that's something I've heard a lot in my time, I don't really know what that means. Unfortunately, my head, hollow as it might be, does not allow you to see inside because I am not a barrel eye fish, a being which is cursed to have a window for a forehead. The barrel eye fish may be one of the most confusing looking things under the sea. I, I mean, take a look at this thing. It kind of looks like it's not finished yet, you know? Like this fish was late for school and it forgot to put its face on. It's got its eyes inside its head and has a translucent head to accommodate that. You know, the rest of all life uh, thought, eyes on the outside, but the barrel eye just had to stand out and be different. Those two big green orbs are the fish's eyes, tinted with a sort of biological sunglasses kind of deal to help it zero in on light above it. The barrel eye uses its bizarre eyes to look upwards, tracking the shadows of its prey and then fixating on it. You wouldn't expect a creature that looks this weird to be an effective predator at all. Special organs on the fish's belly called soles deflect light from the creature's insides, illuminating the deep sea around it and also letting it camouflage. So this weirdo transparent head fish is also a mobile swimming light show. Just goes to show how absolutely amazing life down in the abyss is, where creatures will naturally adapt to their surroundings to evolve to have a flashlight built into them. Bless you, barrel eye fish. Bless you for being you. Number three, sarcastic fringe head. At first glance and description, the sarcastic fringe head doesn't sound particularly horrifying. It looks about as funky as most things you would see in an aquarium. And the name might make you wonder a little bit if it's got a reputation for being sassy, like maybe this is the fish that's always backhandedly complimenting you, which would be terrifying in its own right, but not for the reasons we tend to highlight on this channel. No, the sarcastic name comes from the fish's kind of dour expression, and I definitely do see where that's coming from, because looking at photos of me, it looks like it's judging me just a little bit for my life's choices. Now, when this fish opens its mouth, you'll understand why it earned a spot here. The sarcastic fringe head's mouth can open up wider than its body, creating this delightful delightful image you see here, and you will probably be seeing for the rest of your days. Now if you're a little freaked out looking at this fish that looks like it crawled out of the upside down, that's understandable. But what if I told you that these fish have kiss fights? Sarcastic fringe heads fight for dominance with other fringe heads by expanding their very wide mouths and then pressing them together as a display to show who's got the biggest mouth. This is also how they attract mates, fighting off other fish and smacking their lips together to impress all the lady fringe heads, showing them just how wide their mouths go and man, it is taking so much restraint right now to be talking about this and trying to keep this at a PG rating. Number two, frilled shark. A frilled shark, all things considered, sounds pretty cute. Maybe you're picturing a shark with lovely frills hanging off of it like some other fish have, like a cool fringe denim jacket. Or maybe you're picturing a shark wearing something lacy and frilly. I'm not gonna judge, you do whatever you'd like. Unfortunately, neither of those fantasies are particularly accurate because like everything else on this list, the frilled shark is an abomination of the ocean. It's already unnerving enough to look at, serving massive alien vibe, the James Cameron kind, not the friendly little gray man kind. And then it opens its mouth and you understand where the name comes from as you're treated to a mouth of 300 thrilled razor sharp teeth 
like barbed wire. Just like the alien, they're able to open their jaws real wide to be able to snarf down prey considerably greater than their size, although exactly how much larger is unknown. These little terrors hunt by swimming around with their maw open and using the darkness to try and lure smaller prey right into a trap before being engulfed by what looks like the world's sharpest car wash. I genuinely can't even look at this thing's mouth for too long without starting to feel a little bit queasy, imagining it biting into anything. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil, much like the coelacanth, because in the 80 million years frilled sharks have been swimming across our planet, they haven't changed much. Like. Yeah, at all. They more closely resemble prehistoric creatures than any of their contemporary shark counterparts. All that to say is, I guess, whatever nature was cooking with the frilled shark, clearly they got something right. They, they nailed it. If they, if they saw this thing for 80 million years and thought, absolutely no changes. This one's perfect. Number 1. Colossal Squid At our number 1 spot is a living legend, the Colossal Squid. Thought for many years to be an urban legend due to their elusive nature, for a long time not much was known about these cephalopods other than the fact that they are very, 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 very large. Reports of giant squids describe them as being anywhere up to a staggering 65 feet long, but collected squids range in at a much more humble 42 feet long. Oh. Okay, well that, that's, I was getting worked up over nothing. Humans and colossal squids don't particularly cross paths often, what with them living 3,000 feet under the sea. And that is definitely a good thing, because these squids are not something you would ever want to mess with. Its tentacles are lined with sharp hooks to sink into their prey and prevent them from getting away. Alongside the usual suckers that squids tentacles have, hard toothy like rings that dig into prey and keep them wrangled. It's common to find whales covered in these scars, or slashes and shreds from the hook of a giant squid. The thought of being grabbed by these tentacles is enough to stop me from ever ordering calamari again. What with being one of the bigger monsters swimming around down there, the colossal squid doesn't have much in the way of predators. I guess that's uh, kind of one of the benefits of being a 40 foot monstrosity. People stop messing with you, you know? People stop trying to pick on you. They start respecting you more and no one tries to eat you anymore once you're, you know, bigger than anything else down there. Number five, Wolverine fish. Hugh Jackman, if you're watching this and you like scary stuff, this first one's for you, my dude. In 2021, there were more than 200 new species of just freshwater fish discovered alone. Just freshwater. Hopefully in Cistrus wolverine. Okay, that's a pretty badass name. And a badass looking fish. There is no way in hell I'm taking that thing off of a hook with my hands. Are you kidding me? And you wouldn't want to either, because these fishes have strong lateral curved spikes called undauntus tucked underneath their gills, which at any time they can extend and jab at their prey with these spiky prong-like claws, hence the name. For those of you who don't know Wolverine, he's an X-Men with claws. It kinda goes hand in hand here, you know? The Wolverine fish is actually a catfish, however, that grows up to only about six or seven inches long. They get their name from both the barbed razor sharp prongs associated with them, and the temper and aggression inside of them. Yeah, so like full-blown Wolverine style anger. Luckily for us, they live in between rocks found so far in the Brazilian river of Rio Zingu in the lower Amazon that I don't think you're gonna swim into any one of these soon. I feel like that's where the scariest fish are, the Amazon. Also, kind of confusing biologists, so many species and names alike, but not alike. Catfish, wolf fish, half wolf, half man, X-Men fish. Like every day there's a new fish. Wolverine fish are only herbivores and graze on algae and detritus tucked away deep under rocks. So the likelihood of you just like stepping on one of these are pretty low. Might scare you away from their home, but they won't eat you. Just don't go flipping over any rocks and reaching underneath murky water in the Amazon. That's all I can say for this one. Number four, alien fish? Well, one magnificent alien fish, Advena magnifica, which translates to magnificent alien, hence the name. No, no, it's not from outer space or anything, don't panic. Technically, it's not even a fish. This sea sponge literally gets its name because it just looks like E.T. Hey, I didn't name it, they did. To be fair, it does look like E.T. the alien, come on. The long neck, the huge head, the big eyes, it's literally perfect. This year, a new sea sponge was discovered officially. Well, plucked back in 2017, but they're sure now that it's a completely new species. Over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean, research team from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History came upon a mesmerizing seascape. Dr. Chris Ma of the team dubbed the scene, quote, a forest of the weird. The sea sponge rises up from the seafloor to look exactly onto the direction of the current, mouth open, 
hoping to swallow up some bacteria to eat. That's sick, just an alien sponge sticking their ET heads out, catching the breeze, hoping for some fast food. Doesn't sound like a bad gig. The two holes of the sponge that give it its signature ET eyes appearance are clearly visible on the outside of its head. These holes, technically oscules, serve as openings of which the sponge pumps water out of. The sponge is covered in even tinier pores where the water is drawn into the sponge along with tasty bacteria and other small prey. Just sucked in through small chambers and the water's pumped out through a bunch of canals. Christiana Castello Branco, the researcher who found this deep sea gray, explains the importance of this discovery by saying, quote, as all of these organisms are intricately connected, by documenting and describing marine biodiversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on Earth. Uh, yeah, 100% we're all connected. Let's give these little dudes some clean water. How about that, people, all right? No more Mountain Dew bottles just thrown into the lake. Pick it up. Number three, bulldog fish. Catfish, wolverine fish, now bulldog fish. When are we just gonna have a fish fish, you know? The bulldog fish, or the Zanactinus otix. That sounds like a Decepticon, doesn't it? Zanactinus otix, roll out. Bots, Autobots, <laughs> never mind. This thing can truly teach a new dog some old tricks. Like 90 million years old tricks, because our newest discovery is actually a really, really old one. Extinct, extinct, thankfully. You wouldn't want to haul this thing up in your net. The Dino of the Week blog states that some of the longest bulldog fish ever may have once even measured up to six meters long. Uh, yeah, that's like a regular size shark. The bulldog fish fossils may be quite valuable as well. A fully intact, complete framed specimen sold for about 110,000 at Sotheby's auction house. Is this the reason fish and chips are so expensive nowadays? Like what's going on here? This scary dude roamed the warm shallow waters of the Western Interior Seaway that split America in two halves during the upper Cretaceous period. Distinguished by their heavy bony skull and armed to the tooth with teeth like a nightmare, last year, Andy Moore, a local fisherman, made a discovery while taking part in a fishing competition in Nebraska. When he brought his kayak over to free his line, he first thought that it was a skeleton of something that had recently died, so he just returned back to his tournament. He contacted the sheriff's department after the tournament, worried, and they got back to him saying it was his lucky day. Dude, imagine just reeling in a 90 million year old fish during a fishing tournament. Like, I hope he won. That's definitely first place, isn't it? Oh, Andy? Oh yeah, caught a 90 millioner, yeah. Number two, the barrel eye fish. Tubular eyes, bro. No, seriously, you're Tubular eyes actually are very rare and also significantly puzzling. Say hello to the barrel eye fish or the Macropinna microstoma from the Opus thoproctus species, meaning backwards in Greek, to signify their uniquely designed flipped up eyes luminously inside alive in their head, or backwards. Generally directed upwards and back to detect the silhouettes of both predator and prey, although they can move their eyes back to forward. And basically, they have a sunroof above their head that they can look up from inside their own head. Hey, that's pretty tubular, bruh. They can be found deep in tropical waters in the twilight zone, between 600 and 800 meters down. There are fish that gaze upwards through their transparent heads with eyes like mesmerizing emerald orbs. These domes are huge spherical lenses that sit on a pair of long silvery eye tubes, hence its common name. The barrel eye fish has a green tint over their eyes, which even acts as kind of like a sunglasses to help them track down prey in any sort of lighting. There is literally nowhere to hide, even for a bioluminescent fish. Barrel eyes are one step ahead the entire time. After years of only seeing dead, net caught specimens, in 2021, Bruce Robinson with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California and their high def cameras finally got a pretty good look at these dudes using remotely operated vehicles. Dude, these are apparently really rare. Side note, is this how fish are evolving? Like their heads are becoming see-through all of a sudden? Cause this is terrifying. Like imagine a shark with a sunroof. Number one, the snapping shrimp. This little guy, the snapping shrimp, AKA the pistol shrimp, AKA muscle in the alpha die family. It sounds like a mafia family, doesn't it? Hey, I'm a pistol shrimp with the alpha die family. Who's asking? This little thing. This little thing can literally create a sonic boom under the water right before and as it's attacking you. That's not scary at all. It's so fast you literally don't even know what's happening due to the stun alone and how fast it is. You won't see it coming. You might hear it coming. This thing's sound is that big, it creates a sonic boom. We know nothing, Jon Snow. Like, they're apparently found in coral reefs and oyster reefs. 
These pistol shrimp hit their prey at over 100 kilometers per hour. In doing so, a large air bubble is created and because of this Mike Tyson shrimp is so quick with the jab, the following pop is around 200 decibels. It has a punching hand and a claw hand, like a jab and a cross. The sound stuns their prey first and resembles sticks breaking or cracking of a knuckle under the water. But don't panic, not in any lakes or freshwater, they live in tropical seas. They're usually muddy green or orange in color, usually only about that big. Scientists found that actual light is produced when the bubble pops due to the high temperature and pressure under the water. They're the only ones so far that can do this. I mean, this is pretty sick and also pretty terrifying. The knowledge that fish are starting to learn how to flashbang other fish like they're clearing a room in Call of Duty. Dude, that's where I draw the line. I'm not going swimming anymore at all. Number five, the Lurlian Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10-story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10-story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, there's two more. Another two are growing, yeah. Good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, AKA huge monster. Also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the World Serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, roid rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay-per-view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called 
The Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah. Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg, for sure. And also, the mind control, I don't know how Shark's brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there, yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred text now, the Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities, apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Cause apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature told by two different peoples? Oh, <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon I think would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the twilight zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the king of kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, King of Monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate, yeah. And it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Starting off at our list at number five is Deep Blue, the biggest great white shark ever recorded. Now, when we think of a great white shark, our mind probably goes straight to the shark from Jaws, and there's gonna be a lot of Jaws jokes in this, so bear with me. And Jaws was intentionally sized up to give off a more monstrous appearance for the silver screen, a size no shark could possibly grow to. I mean, the average great white gets anywhere from 12 to 15 feet long, whereas old Bruce in the film was a staggering 25 feet. Well, meet Deep Blue, a great white shark who's 20 feet long, making her the biggest great white shark 
ever recorded. Despite her monstrous size, and I'm gonna be honest, no offense here, horrifying appearance, Deep Blue is actually pretty friendly and has even been recorded swimming with humans, even letting divers hold onto her fins for a ride. Now you could explain to me for six weeks how it's safe to grab onto one of her fins for a swim, and I think I would still stay on the beach, thank you very much. Not sure how comfortable I'd be holding onto something that I know could eviscerate me by accident. Yeah, I guess I do own cats, so maybe I'm guilty of this already. Now, footage of Deep Blue is enough to make me a little queasy. Seeing the size of something this big swimming around makes me shiver. She's the closest thing we have on the Earth to the Megalodon right now and almost makes you wonder, is she 100% Great White or is Deep Blue a distant relative? A great, 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 great sharky granddaughter of the Megalodon. Is there some prehistoric blood throwing through those fins? I'd love to get up close and ask her, but you know, I, I did just eat half an hour ago, so I don't know if I should be going anywhere near the water, so I'll stay where I am for now. And hey, if you're loving the Megalodon content, I know you ghouls do, we've got oceans full of Megalodon videos for you to enjoy and explore on the channel, so get comfy, click through, and why not subscribe while you're here? Coming in at number 4 we have something's coming. Our next clip comes to us from TikTok user Horovitz. Hmm, Horovitz, top 5 scary, maybe we ought to collab. My people will call your people. I'm the people actually, so... Hannah will call you. <laughs> and true to their name, Horovid shares with us something spine chilling. Taken from the front of a boat, the camera spots something on the horizon swimming forward, creating a large wave as it goes. I can't repeat what the caption says, but just know it pretty accurately summarizes what I think most of us would be saying if we saw something this big hurtling towards us. As it's coming forward, it almost looks like it's a submarine dawning on the boat. Until you take a look over the side and get face to face with the absolute absolutely heaving unit of a shark swimming happily alongside them. The commenters on this video took note of this, with someone writing, that's a baby mega. Scientists estimate that baby megalodons would have been around 8 to 10 feet long at birth, so if anything, we're being underwhelming calling this thing a baby meg. Someone else writes, so megs aren't hiding anymore. Nope, they're done playing and they're letting us know they are here. It's hard to get feel just from this clip, but there's no denying the shark is massive. Scary is still is how it disappears back into the water after rising, a scary reminder of just how deep the ocean's waters go, and just how far away from them I'd prefer to be. Now some commenters have suggested this could be a basking shark, a docile species of shark that avoids humans. But take a look at a basking shark's mouth and then tell me if you still trust that it's docile. Sure it only eats plankton, but I'm not taking any chances with something that's got a mouth that looks like a black hole. Number 3. Curious Shark Another clip posted to TikTok, this one shows us a very brave great white shark who just wants to know exactly what all the commotion is about as it comes up to greet a couple of sailors by the side of a boat, saying hello the way only a shark knows how, by gnawing on just about everything it can get its teeth on. The shark in this video is massive, looking big enough to appear in my nightmares tonight and every night after that, especially when it starts to make its way up to the boat's motor, thrashing about, chewing on everything to see if maybe, just maybe, any of this is edible. It gets far too close for comfort for me. I mean, already being face to face with a shark is one thing, and this guy is basically inches away from this thing's mouth. And who's to say what could have happened if this massive predator prapped itself even a little bit more onto the surface of the boat? It'd be the captain now, that's for sure. It's a scary reminder that when it comes down to it, a shark is a wild, uncontrollable animal. And as safe as we think we are on the water, we always have to remember who actually runs things down there. We're coming onto their turf. Now, the people filming this video have got some fantastic composure, I've got to say, laughing through the whole thing as if there isn't a prehistoric sized sea monster flopping around trying to eat their means of travel. That's the kind of confidence I'd like to get someday. Either that or it's that nervous laughter you do when you know you're in serious trouble and you're too scared to react properly. I kind of suspect it's the second one. Swimming in at number two spot is this TikTok clip posted us from Shark ABC ABC, who from the name alone I have to imagine is pretty into sharks and shark based content. In this short clip, we see an absolute titan of a shark swimming up to check in on a bunch of surprised tourists who are all huddled together on a boat in a way that's making me extremely nervous. Just from looking at the shark swimming up slowly to the boat, I start to sweat. The thing is practically the size of the boat itself. It looks like it could upend the whole thing and send everyone into the water just by accident. Maybe it's just everyone crammed onto that tiny little boat that's really getting to me. You know what these people need when you see a giant shark in the water? I've been waiting all video to say this, you're gonna need a bigger boat. Worth it, we did it. Okay, end the video here, I hit my peak. <laughs>
Luckily, despite all my worrying, no one in this clip was hurt as the shark was just checking them out, probably scouting them, letting all this little sharky buddies know for later that if you swim up real cute and let the humans take pictures of you, it makes it real easy to get the drop on them. I just don't trust them. And finally, at number one, the beach stalker. Our number one clip comes to us from Dubai. The video captured shows a bunch of tourists and locals enjoying a day on the beach when they'd be disturbed by something a little fishy, or rather something big and fishy and sharky to be specific. I'll stop beating around the bush. It's a giant shark that came up to the beach. That's, that's what I'm trying to imply. A shark was spotted stalking its prey on the coast of Kite Beach, a beautiful beach popular with the tourists. The shark can be seen almost sneaking up on the beachgoers. How? I'm not quite sure. Usually the music cues gives this sort of thing away. While most of the beachgoers have the good enough sense to hustle up onto the sand away from the shark, surprisingly slowly though, I've gotta say, this one lady saunters out of here like it's nothing. I've seen people get out of a pool faster because somebody peed in the water, let alone that there's a shark pacing up and down trying to decide which one of you looks like it'll make the best appetizer. The thing swims up and down like it's scanning the buffet. Scarier still than that is the woman who's caught out in the water between a shark and the hard place. We see the lifeguard charging in to try and keep the situation cool and hats off to the guy because that's more cool and collected than I could possibly be, but that's why he's a lifeguard and I'm a YouTube host. Luckily, no one was hurt during this and everyone got themselves off the beach and made it out safely, but I'd bet you anything it was probably a bit of time before any of these beach bums ever made it way back to the water. Woof. Number five, the mystery sea monster. Starting off at number five, a research crew in Australia was studying the movement pattern of sharks, attaching a tracking device to a nine foot long shark to observe and report on its migration habits. What they found was a lot more compelling and a lot more disturbing than just monitoring a shark's Fitbit. After attaching the device, the team found that the shark had rose in temperature steeply and it also descended approximately 2,000 feet below where it should be, where it then stayed for the better part of a week. Surely it was just doing a little sharky sightseeing. Occasionally ascending and descending. From here, the trail goes completely cold. No data, no insights. Until about four months later, the tracking device and absolutely nothing else washed up on a beach in southern Australia. The crew was completely stumped. No answers. Something had eaten their shark, that much was obvious. But what? Well, their best guess isn't going to provide you much comfort because their hypothesis was that it must have been a much larger, much meaner shark preying on a smaller one like a schoolyard bully. Which is six kinds of terrifying if the best thing scientists can come up with to explain this is, oh there's a gigantic shark with a taste for other sharks swimming around and oh yeah we have no idea what it actually is and to be honest we have no idea where it could be. It's great when scientists are kind of just throwing guesses at the wall. Unfortunately, no brighter insights about just what exactly it was that ate that original shark can be found because, well, they just never found the thing. So whatever did eat it could very well still be out there. Let's just be thankful that whatever the thing that ate it was, it's hiding out in Australia. And to our Australian viewers, maybe just uh, check the water a little bit before your next surfing trip for me, okay? For me. Number four. The Merino Rocks Shark. At number four, also in Australia, that's going to be a recurring theme, a shark conservation research team was observing local sharks from above in a helicopter surrounding Merino Rocks, a beach on the coast of southern Australia, when one of the researchers spotted a gargantuan great white circling just outside the beach. The shark was estimated to be 7 meters long, or 23 feet. Now, great whites rarely extend past 20 feet, so 23 feet was astronomical making this thing one of the largest great white sharks ever recorded on camera. The shark actually matches up pretty decently with the size of the shark from Jaws, which, little Hollywood trivia for you, was intentionally designed to be out of proportion and oversized, which is beyond horrifying if the things we created to intentionally be scary looking is being outdone daily by Mother Nature's own creativity and what she's got cooking underwater. Now the helicopter crew attempted to wrangle this shark out to sea to get a closer look on it and maybe lock it in a steel vault somewhere, but were unsuccessful successful in any of their attempts to wrangle this thing. So, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that means whatever this shark is, it's still out there swimming around Merino Rocks, hopefully not getting up to too much trouble. Horrifying to think about a pleasant day at the beach and then coming up close and personal with a shark, you know, big enough to swallow you whole and then eat two more of you if it felt like it. Number three, TikTok's Massachusetts Megalodon. Recently, a marine biodiversity student and musician, Alex Albrecht, was on a research cruise with fellow marine biology students when they made a jaw-dropping discovery. And like most people, upon discovering something potentially life-changing, swiftly posted the video to TikTok. Looking over the railing of a cruise ship, swimming around the ship is a behemoth of a shark, estimated to measure in at around 26 feet looking truly prehistoric as it swims around the ship. 
The video is taken up from the rigging of the ship just to give you a good sense of just how stupendously large this thing is. In the video, one of the researchers can even be loudly heard asking if that's the famed Megalodon swimming around them. Now, obviously after this video was posted, it went viral pretty quick. I mean, it had the attention of everybody, garnering up to 36 million views, and catching the attention of shark aficionados, megalodon hunters, and people with a lot more shark authority than me, who suspect that the shark in question is not the legendary megalodon, but in fact a basking shark, one of the largest species of sharks on the planet, dwarfed only by the whale shark in terms of sheer size. Now, you look at this thing, and it's pretty easy to understand why a shark this big could have shocked a fully stocked crew of marine researchers, having them convinced that they've gone toe to tooth with the Meg. Basking sharks, luckily enough, are docile and ambivalent towards humans, but look at the inside of this thing. Does this not look like something out of your absolute worst nightmares? Like something out of an H.P. Lovecraft story? This thing could swallow me whole and not even realize it had done it. It's got a mouth like a black hole. The only comfort I'm finding is that if this thing is swimming around the shores of Boston, if it causes any trouble, surely Mark Wahlberg is there to protect us. Number two, Marianas Trench Sighting. Now besides sharing the name with the Canadian smash hit pop band, the Marianas Trench is notable for being the deepest trench in our oceans, meaning if anything absolutely spine chilling was living under the radar, away from the prying eye of research crews, there is a fairly good chance it would be swimming around down here. I mean, over 80% of our oceans remain unexplored, and in that uncharted 80%, scientists theorize that roughly two-thirds of all oceanic life has yet to be discovered. It's a testament to just how deep and dark our oceans run, so it's not uncommon for theorists to suspect that this is where the mighty prehistoric megalodon could be hiding. And footage released in 2018 might be the evidence to prove that. In this footage, a behemoth of a shark can be seen swimming by what looks to be an abandoned shark cage of some sort. And from the image and video, the shark dwarfs the cage. Its head alone conjures up the imagery we expect when thinking of the mighty megalodon. I, I mean, just look at the size of this thing. You can move a family of four inside that thing's mouth and still have room for a sublet on the side. Now the clip is a bit shocking and obviously got a lot of attention on it, meaning experts peer in and the clip doesn't have everyone convinced. Some skeptics believe that the shark in question is not the megalodon, but rather a species of shark called a sleeper shark, another species of enormous shark that can grow up to sizes of up to 23 feet long and lives thousands of feet below sea level, adapting to extreme temperatures, even able to live underneath volcanoes. If a shark as extreme as the sleeper shark is swimming around there, it doesn't take too much of a stretch of the imagination to wonder if it's joined by anything like the megalodon. Number one, the 1918 sighting. Our number one spot is also our oldest recorded entry and a story that popularized the modern haunt for the prehistoric titan. In the early 19th century, a group of lobster fishermen outside of, I mean, come on, we all know where it took place. Do I even need to say it? Australia. The story took place in Australia. Almost all of these did. These lobster fishermen were shaken to their core when the men claimed that they had seen a shark of preposterous size. Naturalist David Stead provided a written description of the sighting, which is what we've been going on writing that the men had been at work on the fishing grounds, which lie in deep water, when an immense shark of almost unbelievable proportions put in an appearance, lifting pot after pot containing many crayfishes, and taking, as the men said, the pots, mooring lines, and all. These crayfish pots, it should be mentioned, were about three feet, six inches in diameter, and frequently contained from two to three dozen good-sized crayfish, each weighing several pounds. The men were all unanimous that this shark was something the like of which they had never dreamed of. The claims from the fishermen was that the shark was somewhere between 115 feet to a staggering 300 feet. The men insisted that the water boiled as this beast swam past. And as if this salty old campfire story wasn't scaring you enough already, the men also all claimed together that the shark was a ghastly white, calling to mind the white whale from Moby Dick. Unfortunately, since it was the 19th century, we don't have a convenient TikTok to watch over and over and analyze frame by frame, so we have to take whatever scraps we can get, which is the word of a bunch of old lobster fishermen. It's entirely possible that, you know, a few beers deep and 12 hours in the sun would cause you to start to see anything. But by that same token, it could just have been likely that these men witnessed something thought long extinct. 